I chose this topic perfectly and properly loved. And these two words came to me and the full understanding of God after I read The Desire of Ages and then recently Steps to Christ. And then I realized what I simply did not understand. And it was that there's only one person that can perfectly and properly love me. A lot of times we fall in love and others fall in love with us. And we have magnificent people in our lives. I have two great friends. And one is on the platform, welcome Moya. And when I think of them and I'm using them because I've had over 40 years of experience with them. And I can truly say two people love me. And, but they love me differently. One is a tactile and runs around loving and doing and doing and doing. And the other one, Moina, is fierce with her love. She's fierce. She's a protector. She shields. She guards. And she is a warrior with her love. And this I can experience because of the years of trust in relationship. I know my husband loves me and I know my children love me and my brothers and my family love me. And they love me in spite of who I am. Some of us, because we have families, we, we, we have no choice but to love our families. We didn't choose it. And, but beyond all that, there are times when we always feel that we are properly understood. But there's one person who covers all of that. And that's God, who perfectly and properly loves us. Amen. My brother, who lives, one of my brothers, well, both my brothers live in New York. And this particular brother, he is an assistant chief district attorney. And he told me a story recently about his daily commute to work on the D train. To him, it was an ordinary day. And I'd like to just add that I'm just briefly going over the story. It's not in depth, but he did a wonderful sermon because he's the elder of a church called Advent Hope in New York City, Manhattan, and he preached on, I found God on the D, or I saw Jesus. I'm not sure of the title, but it was something that of that nature where he saw God on the D train. So if you would like, you can go to YouTube or to the Advent Hope website and um, look for Derek Linton's um, sermon on that and you can hear it for it in its entirety. So he went on to tell me that on, it was an ordinary day until he got on the train, stood against the door and noticed a man curled up asleep on the seat adjacent to him. The man was disheveled, yet all his belongings, it seemed, was neatly packed in a cart and his sneakers placed together under the seat. He seemed comfortable, which indicated that this was something he was used to. Unexpectedly, a man walked in from another car of the train. He was neatly dressed, shoes a size too big, but carried an odor that informed that he had not showered in days. His hair and beard uncombed, and he quickly looked at the man lying deep in sleep, which was evident from his deep breathing, and sat on the seat in front of him, leaning forward, looking straight at him. My brother, the prosecutor that he is, went for his phone and discreetly set it to camera, 
anticipating a crime. When the seated man put his hand in his pocket, at which point my brother adjusted his camera inconspicuously and noticed him take a several take several books, take several bills, placed it into the sleeping man's coat pocket. Then he sat down, clasped his hands, raised his head, lips moved in prayerful posture. My brother shamefully lowered his camera in awe of the most beautiful act of selflessness between two people that seemed equally in need, yet one willing to give some of what he had, if not all. My brother disembarked the train at the next stop, looked back at the praying Samaritan and realized he had just witnessed a beautiful action of love. Not knowing the relationship between the two men, or if there was one, it didn't matter. For what he witnessed was God in action, prompting love in the heart of a needy man. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your tokens of love displayed every day. May we see them and appreciate your love right before us in nature, in acts of kindness, and more so in your love demonstrated in the wilderness, in Gethsemane and on the cross. In your beautiful and lovely name, Jesus. Amen. Perfect and properly loved. You can take a minute if you don't mind and close your eyes if you wish. This is just to allow you to focus and scan quickly through all the persons you know and love and the various experiences. Now with full and true honesty, has anyone that has acknowledged loving you, has loved you, the person that you are, perfectly and properly? You don't, of course, need to answer. You can think about it a little more. The meaning and acceptance of love has been watered down in my opinion. A presenter, for example, on a TED talk will tell his audience how much he, she loves them. Performing artists do the same to their fans, shouting out a big, I love you. I've never really connected with that skeptically. I will wonder how he or she loves me and does not even know what I look like, at the least my name. But it is surprising that that liberal expression of love does something emotionally and physically. It is an immediate barrier remover and creates a universal connection. The beautiful thing about love when expressed and demonstrated is all from God capital A-L-L. -L. God is the creator of love. God is love, is being the operative word, the ultimate representative of love. How can you know when someone loves you? Well, by the trust that has developed over time based on their consistent behavior of loving actions, until you know, without a doubt, that you are loved by your spouse, your friend, neighbor, or family member. Your confidence level in their love for you keeps growing while doubts slowly disappear. Because you can always go back to the experiences in the relationship which built the foundation of the relationship. Yet, there is not one person you know, no matter how much they love you, can they embody love? You and I cannot say to your spouse, I can say John, my friend Moina, Dawn, my children, Derek, um, Ricardo, Jessica, Nadia, my mother, Miss Lou, L mother is love. Only God is love, who made man perfectly happy and holy as in steps to Christ. 
and the fair earth as it came from the creator's hand bore no blight of decay or shadow of curse. It is transgression of God's law, the law of love that has brought woe and death. Yet, even amid the suffering that results from sin, God's love is revealed. The theodicy of God's love in nature itself are messages of hope and comfort. There are flowers upon the thistles and the thorns are covered with roses. God is love, is written upon every opening bud, upon every spur of springing grass. The loving birds making the air vocal with their happy song, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfections perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with rich foliage of living green, all to testify the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. What love? Desire. The word desire is derived from love. To desire is to have a strong feeling, to have something, anticipating something to happen. This is God demonstrating his infinite love. What is amazing to me is that all God's children are not the same. Those of us who have more than one child will say, I love my, child, my children equally. However, each child is different as we are in God's eyes. He knows we are all wired differently and recognizes our idiosyncrasies and knows us way more than we will ever know ourselves. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. He is slow to anger and of great kindness because he delighted in mercy. Jonah 4, 2 and Micah 7, 8. God continues to reveal his love in us, in the things of nature. The deepest earthly relationship we can possibly have and enjoy, as Ellen White in Steps to Christ says, all these things are imperfectly representing God's love. Wow, that is infinite and beyond reach to love like that. Jesus left glory, as in John 1, 18, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father. Now he left that beautiful comforting place, somewhere where he knows and is comfortable to live among earthly men, that he could dispel Satan's deceitful ambition to convince man that God is a severe judge, a harsh and exacting creditor, and stern justice. Jesus showed his mercy and love in healing the sick. His compassion was seen in every act of his life, in the very way he treated the disenfranchised, suffering the little children to come unto him the poor and feeble. Jesus never said a severe word or was rude. He never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. I just love this. He never censors our weaknesses. He spoke the truth, but in love. He denounces hypocrisy, unbelief and iniquity. Tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. Steps to Christ, page 13. Now, that is to be loved perfectly and properly. Would you not agree? God cares about our vulnerability, even in our sinfulness. He treats us with tenderness because every soul is precious to him. Can you compare God's love or even some of God's attributes of love with anyone you know who loves you? Do you know someone that will not censor your weaknesses? Will never judge your good motives? 
will always speak to you in love and with love? Well, maybe you do know someone who is daily striving to be like Jesus, deliberately effectuating who God is, allowing God's love to penetrate his or her, or her being. As the hymn says, live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. Live out thy life within me, in all things have thy way, I the transparent medium, thy glory to display. Truly, Jesus understands us. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53. He loves and understands our weaknesses. That comes from an experience. That he, his love, sorry, understands our weaknesses. That comes from our experiences of betrayal, our hurt, difficulties, and pain. At times we feel like no one understands us or what we feel because we are all made differently. Our emotions are different. Some of us are more sensitive than others. Our backgrounds and past gets mixed up into how we respond and behave. We aren't even aware that we are carrying baggage that needs to be handed over to the one who loves us perfectly and properly. He is sympathetic to our individuality. Only he fully knows us. We must determine daily to spend time with the lover of our soul in the locations where he overcame the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life in the wilderness, in Gethsemane, where he was separate, separated from his father, on the cross, where he felt forsaken, and connect with the revelation of God is love, where God's selfless love is on display. Let us spend the time in these scenes to get to the heart of who Jesus is, who gave up everything. Here Jesus pours out his heart of infinite love and paid the price. This is, there is no greater love that embraces all of humanity and he loves us no less, even when we reject his love. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses on, upon them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We can easily stop loving someone because we can only love partially and conditionally. But only under the power of God can we love unconditionally. We need God in every single aspect of our lives to love. So beautiful of God to make us with the ability to love, for we are made in his image. Yet, as much as we can love, we hate. This is the cosmicism of, or state we find ourselves in, that there is no recognizable presence of God, and we see each other as insignificant in the larger scheme of life. These are the times we allow ourselves to be overcome by emotions and feelings instead of immediately giving them over to our loving God who is infinite in love, infinite sacrifice, infinite pity, infinite power. We are valuable to God and God gives us the ability to see others as valuable. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
obedience is love, as in the hymn. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and feel it. Feel it for thy courts above. I share Martin Luther's quote. It says, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget the gospel every day. The gospel is good news. Love is good news. Let us spread both. Let us create an ecosystem of love wherever we go and with whomever we meet. I close with 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. But there, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, which is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in the mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know, in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is choosing to give another person what we, what, sorry, let me read that. Love is choosing to give another person what they need the most when they deserve it the least at great personal cost. And this is the example of Jesus. Thank you for listening.